much checking, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Orange Bloods Recruiting Hour here on Orange Bloods Live. I'm Jeff Ketchum, joined by Chad Hastings, Jason Sukamel. Uh, do us a solid, hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, get notifications, all those things. And thanks to the fine people at Specs for being the sponsor of the Specs Chat. We'll take your chats, your comments, your super chats. If you have a super chat, you go right to the front of the line because we are whores and we like money. Uh, <laughs> A lot of breaking news to get into on top of just regular news and recruiting news and um, players that were at the spring game, things that we'll talk to Sukumel about. We've had some, we've had an addition and a subtraction on the Texas Scholarship Board. Big news is officially Bill Norton, Arizona nose tackle, Chad, is a longhorn. He announces today that he is officially making the switch that, quite frankly, we all thought he was going to be making. From the moment his name entered the portal, uh, it's done. He's going to be a Longhorn. That moved the Longhorns up to 85. And then news got out like about a half hour ago. Um, if I'm not, I think it was Pete Thamel was the first to report. Uh, has since been confirmed. Savion Red, uh, sixth on the running back totem pole. Uh, and kind of ran exclusively with the third string offense on Saturday. Announces... He's entering the transfer portal. That is not a shock at all. So now the Longhorns are back down to 84. So they add a, a player at the position that Steve Sarkeesian said they needed more big bodies. They need more talent. They need more help. The first step of that is in. And the running back depth takes not a hit, but with five guys on scholarship now, the numbers aren't quite. that. That's not crazy. So it certainly sets the table, I think, for running back recruiting uh, in the 2025 recruiting class. So, uh, Jason, lots of things to get to. Yep. For the uh, of what I just talked about, is Norton the thing that stands out the most? Probably. I guess anytime you have an addition, right? That's that's the more exciting news <laughs> than a guy entering the portal uh, and, and leaving your team. But uh, yeah, I think you know the Bill Norton thing, like you said. I, and I'm probably going to call him Bill Walton at one point during this month, this video. I keep having to check myself, Bill Norton. Uh, you know, the second he entered the portal catch, kind of like the Jay Toia the kid, the other de- kid, but the other defensive tackle who visited this weekend. I mean, we both had him on commit watch, really, from the time they entered the portal. Then you find out they're visiting, and then it's like, okay, like the wheels are in motion here. So, uh, so much so that in fact, I was trying to hit up Bill repeatedly last night just to try to get confirmation like on or off the record. Uh, hey, dude, is this going to go down? And uh, he was pretty quiet, which wasn't totally unexpected. But you and I both had – you had your instant analysis. I had a commitment story written and ready for when he did go public today. But, you know, pretty big addition. I mean, listen, it's not – Hey, Jason, most- real quick. Yeah. You're like way over-modulated in on your microphone. Let's see if – Yeah. It's so loud. Now I don't hear you at all. I tried to turn him down a little bit on our end. Oh, now I'm not hearing him at all. Still nothing at all. Yeah, now we're not hearing you at all, Jason. Oh, no better. A little more faint now. And now he's blurry and. Testing, now it sounds a little more normal changing. to me, Cat. I've not changed anything. Yeah, it's just that now. It- his voice is not matched up with his lips. He's got a big drag. Jason, can you come out and come back in? Yeah, yeah let me do that. Yes. Jason is going to depart for a second. Yeah, that got worse. Like the audio was bad, and then <laughs> it just – that we had no audio, and then he was – anyway. Uh, Chad, I'll give you the same question I asked Jason as he uh, resets his modem or does whatever it is that he needs to do on his end. Um We've been talking about Bill Norton so much. I almost feel like we're over talking about him. But mm-hmm. in reality, Steve Sarkeesian said on Saturday that they needed defensive tackle help, that they weren't good enough, they weren't deep enough, they didn't have enough big bodies. Less than two days later or approximately two days later, right on time, here comes Bill Norton. Uh, he is a piece of whatever Calvary is on the way. Yeah, it is the big, you know, is is the big discussion point in terms of the X's and O's of this team right now, uh, with the Johnny Nansen connection there. And yeah, just an interesting 
it's a it's kind of a wild position right now. You had obviously Vernon Broughton away from the team for the spring game, getting married, uh, and then you had Alfred Collins making the play to start the game. Uh, but then Sarkeesian clearly at the end saying, "We need more big humans," and this is the first big human. Uh, Jason already referenced Toya. Uh, maybe being a second big human, uh, and both these guys would have Nansen connections, and we can, you know, get into all that. But uh, you know, two guys, I see them both listed at three twenty-five, uh, Jason. So it's not just a, a big deal figuratively. These are big guys, middle of the D line, and I know in catches instant analysis, he talked about the idea that Norton, you know, felt like a starter to him. Is that what it feels like to you, a guy that can plug right in as a starter for Texas, maybe day one? Sure, seems like it. Uh... You know, with all due respect to the guys in the rotation, you know, Alfred Collins is, is what he is. But, I mean, Vernon Broughton, I think, might have a hard time uh, keeping Bill Norton off out of that, that top of the uh, top spot on the depth chart. Um, you know, you don't bring these guys in. I mean, Texas obviously has a huge need for big guys in the middle. They're not bringing these guys in to be kind of situational players, I think. So, uh, you know, he's going to have to come in and earn it. But I, I think based on his trajectory, his history, his experience – yeah, I would expect certainly probably by the season opener or maybe not too long after, but probably before the season opener would be my guess. I would expect he would be a day one starter. I agree with Ketch's assessment there. Yeah, I'm looking at Alex Dunlap's mid-camp depth chart that he put together. And at nose tackle, the order, Chad, uh, much better, Jason. Yes. Um, at nose tackle, it was Broughton. Now, they played Sadir Mitchell earlier on Saturday than I think a lot of people were expecting. Matter of fact, he, I think if I'm not mistaken, he played in the Broughton role, but you've got Mitchell, you've got Aaron Bryant and you've got Alex January. And I think the thing about that group of four is that three of those guys don't feel quite ready for prime time. I don't, I don't think they feel confident that Mitchell's a major contributor January. I mean, he's still such a young guy. It's hard to know. Brian is a guy that got a lot of love at various times in the spring. His name was getting mentioned. Sark mentioned him. The thing is, if you really thought that guy was about to take off, you're probably not going to get Bill Norton because you'd probably think, well, we've got Vernon Broughton. Whatever he is is whatever he is. But, boy, Brian's got to – we don't want to do anything that's going to impede his, his ascension. And I think one of the things that I wrote about in my 10 thoughts on the weekend, and I don't mind saying here, is that I think there are two guys in Jeray Bledsoe and Aaron Bryant that I wonder what these defensive tackle moves, I wonder what they think about this. Because I think you could probably make a case that going into the weekend, the, the defensive tackle totem pole probably looked like this. Collins, Savea, Broughton, and then either Aaron Bryant or Bledsoe, right? So they were either fourth or fifth in the pecking order. It could be that by the end of next week, they've added Norton. If they add another, then suddenly Bryant and Bledsoe are sixth and seventh in the pecking order because suddenly Collins would be a senior, Broughton would be a senior, Savea would be a senior, Norton would be a senior, Anybody else that you bring in probably is an upperclassman as well. So I, it's fascinating to see what happens here on the defensive tackle situation. Zach Swanson transferred. But Jason, if you're Bryant or Bledsoe, you may very quickly, I think, be in a position where you're needing to rationalize and be realistic with yourself that 2025, if you're going to stick at Texas, you're probably going to have to wait another year that these moves – or is Sark telling – I think some of these guys, we need to do better. We need to be better across the board. And I think from a playing time expense, it's going to come at the younger guys. Well, and normally you'd be looking at those guys as potential portal candidates, right? I mean, yeah. they might be still. But the fact, like you mentioned, all the guys ahead of them are going to be seniors probably leaving the program next year. So, you know, maybe can you be patient for one more year? To me, Catch, this goes back to – and uh, you know, I don't want to – beat a dead horse, a guy that's no longer in town, but, you know, we've said it all along. I mean, Bo Davis did not necessarily recruit that position at a high level. He took a lot of names in a couple classes, but they weren't the highest rated guys and some of them just haven't panned out. So, um, you know, I think it's 
on Kenny Baker. Hey, you're going to have to do a good job this year filling the gaps with these transfers. But boy, Kenny, you did, Kenny <laughs> has some pressure on himself to recruit at a higher level. And just bottom line is get you know more ho- high profile, higher ranked interior defensive linemen. But um, you, you know, it, it's interesting. Savea comes. And then Bill Norton comes and like Savea's probably thinking, damn, dude, I just left. And now you're going to come take my snaps from me in my new place. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, it's, it's just, there's a lot of interesting storylines in this. And I think we all probably agree. They're probably not done. I think they're obviously still looking to bring in at least one more, uh, the interior defensive lineman. So, but you're right for the young guys like uh, Bryant and some of those other young dudes, you know, Alex January being a true freshman, you expect he'll be patient, but you know, those other guys are probably going to, you know, they should be able to see the writing on the wall that they're probably not going to get a lot of a uh, rotational play this year, but maybe that door opens up for them next year. Guys, let's remind everybody uh, as we're discussing the por- the portal today, and obviously it's the recruiting hour, so it all kind of fits together. We'll talk about recruits that were at the spring game and all that kind of stuff. We also want to remind everybody about this Orange Bloods deal. It's in its last day, so get it done today. Get a month, you're getting three months free. OB Spring 24. We sit here today, 131 days from the kick uh, of Colorado State, 70 days till Texas becomes an SEC team, and all the info is waiting on you at orangebloods.com. Heck, these two guys jumped on Orange Bloods today and both gave you breakdowns of Bill Norton when it became official. So that's the kind of stuff you're going to get all the time at orangebloods.com. Get that done. This is the last day uh, to get it done on this. Well, and I would say on the Norton front, like, we pretty much reported that he was coming to Texas an hour. You know, I, that, I, I posted that like two Fridays ago, mm-hmm. an hour into the portal that our Arizona guys were telling us that felt like a slam dunk that he was going to Texas. So we got more content on Orange Bloods at this exact moment than you can probably consume. There's a lot of pin comments, all sports, baseball, basketball, football recruiting, you name it. Um Come check out the content. Check out the message board. Uh, if you missed it, I had a post. Jason saw it. I had an update on the Spice Girls today <laughs> on yeah. Orange Bloods. You never know what you're going to get. Wow. Okay. Uh, Posh had her 50th, Chad. Um, yes, I, I was aware. In fact, I, I uh, gave Anwar a buy or sell on her 50th to see if oh. he knew in- to see if he knew any of the spices and he knew none. He couldn't tell me oh. her spice. He couldn't tell me her spice and he couldn't tell me the other four. Did you know that Ginger and Mel B had a hot affair and that's one of the reasons why the band broke up? Whoa, I did not know that. That was the biggest That's what you get on Orange Bloods on any given day is yeah. that sort of insight. Hey, you know what? That I can't nothing can sell it better than that. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> There you go. Somebody was like, ban the OP was one post. And then the guy right below him was like, I had no no idea that Hollowell was swinging on both sides for both teams. And I was like, you want to ban me, but would you deprive let them hang of this new knowledge of the Spice Girls that I saw on social media and shared with the world? Um, That's hardcore right there. Chad, you asked me real quick. We'll move on. I mean – there's not, you know, I, 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 someone asked the question real quick before I, I do this. Uh, was it Derek? Yes, Derek had the question. Alex Dunlap thinks Norton is a slight upgrade to Broughton. Do you agree? Do we still take Williams and uh, Toa or just one of the two? Derek, first of all, you, there's a lot to unpack there, but one of the things I was just about to mention to Chad, which is why you asking it, and the question format and the specs chat is beautiful. Uh, a, yes, I do ag- agree. He's a slight upgrade to Broughton. He was a 13-game starter. You know, the thing to know is, like, he comes from Tennessee as a prospect. He signs with Georgia. He's three years into the Georgia strength and conditioning program. He transfers to Arizona, 13-game starter there on a really good defense. And then the defensive coordinator from Arizona comes to Texas – And one of the things he said about Bill Norton last season was, you're damn right he's coming back for another year because he really valued Norton as a player. And little did Nansen know when he made that comment that he would eventually be at Texas, and so would Bill Norton. Like those, those, 
you know, we can't stress enough. Nansen's fingerprints on this defensive line remake is extensive. Tia Savea and, and, and Bill Norton both uh, come from Arizona directly with Johnny Nansen. And then you're thinking about Jay Toa, the, the kid at UCLA, who was essentially recruited from USC to UCLA by Nansen and then has been at UCLA and then Nansen moved on to Arizona. Um, do we still take Williams and Toa, both of them, or just one of the two? Chad asked me this as a buyer's sell in House Divided, or if you missed it, our show uh, here on Orange Woods Live earlier today. And I said sell, that I think they would sign two defensive tackles. But let me let me put an asterisk on this, Chad, because I think they probably would take both of those guys if they both wanted to come. I joked with a source going into the weekend, did Texas want – every single defensive tackle in the portal? Hmm. And the answer was yes. But if they took those two guys, it wouldn't – and I you know, I don't want to be that guy that throws the I, – I think you're probably going to see one of your older guys depart, and I think you'd have to keep an eye on Vernon Broughton at that point. If they bring in Williams and Toa and Norton and Savea – from the earlier portal window, suddenly that's four guys. I think Alfred Collins probably feels okay. But if I'm Vernon Broughton, I'm asking, am I fifth? Like, if this is my last year and I came back for one more go-round, do I need to go someplace where I'm starting and playing every game? I don't even know where that is. I think it's a fascinating question, Jason, to say – Vernon Broughton right now in the spring was starting at nose tackle for Texas. If he ended up in the portal, what level of school signs him? I don't know. I, you know, I, yeah. I, uh, would he be at a power five? Uh, probably so, but I don't know that it's a, a given. Um, I don't know that he automatically starts. That's the thing. Like, I he might have You know, we're talking about if they bring in a set another defensive three tackle. guys yeah he may be having those thoughts already catch with two guys being brought in and to, to answer Derek's question do they still take Williams and Toya um they would I think but you got to use some common sense here they're not going to get four transfer portal guys right those guys are transferring most of them are upperclassmen a big thing they're looking for is a wide open depth chart you're not going to be able to I mean not the idea of getting four defensive tackle transfers to me that seems damn near impossible, but I do think, you know, they've got a really good shot, obviously with the Toya from UCLA, you know, Williams, we'll see, we'll see if he actually takes that visit. Uh, I think it's tomorrow, actually. We'll see if he takes that visit and then we'll see what he has to say afterwards. But yeah, I think they certainly will take one more, which puts him at three defensive tackle, uh, new, new faces, new acquisitions. And if you're Vernon Broughton, just the fact that they've got two and maybe three, boy, you got to be wondering what your future is or what your role on that defense is uh, at this point. And it could help explain the weekend situation. It could help explain the why. I don't was it? think so. I mean, Whatever I didn't that I, was. I don't know. Like, I don't, because it all, I mean, it would make it would make sense, I suppose. Um, but I don't think, he, like, he's trying to, act, I think that's an, a weird even when I know not to take vacation in late uh, late April. I mean, we just gotta know, right? Like we know, like when I know what weeks are somewhat safe to get away. Uh, Vernon Broughton had to have known that was just, that was just a weird deal. I mean, I, I didn't even know about it because I was down at the game, and the, so I'm assuming it was what announced on television or something. Yeah, a little bit before the game, it was like okay. Vernon Broughton's getting married. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even know, so I'm down like, where's Vernon? And like, I thought, did he hit the portal? What's going on? Then I saw it on Orange Bloods. I'm like, whoa, yeah. what kind of, that was just a very very odd uh, decision and odd yeah. timing for sure. It's bizarre. And, and I'll be honest, guys, because of all this, that is the first thought that crossed my mind. But obviously, we've talked about it. There could be extenuating circumstances we don't know about. You hope he's able to come back and just help help that rotation and help the depth. But, Catch, you're bringing up the point. Of have just, how many would it take before 45 looks at it and thinks, okay, I mean, I, I yeah, I, I'm going to have to think of, you know, Think of well, something because you else. could you could talk Bryant and Bledsoe into all these guys that they brought in are they got four senior defensive tackles at this point. 
Collins, Broughton, Savea, and now Norton. I mean, they're all going to be gone after this year. So, you know, you could talk to Bryant and Bledsoe and say, you guys could be starters next year. I mean, at this point, they could legitimately say, we don't have anybody in front of you or we don't know of anybody that would definitely be in front of you. And it would be true, but those guys will also know they'll just go back into the portal and sign three more guys next year if they yeah. need to. I mean, Sark seems like a guy. Jason Sark even went on record. I think he was a little anti-portal early on. I think he was a little like, I don't want to be one of these coaches that's using the portal a whole bunch and maybe a spot here or a spot here. Sark's like one of those guys that has a credit card with no with no limit on it. He's like, I like using this thing. Mm-hmm. And we've seen them like go into the portal and, you know, they they take Kendrick Blackshire. That guy's like running third string linebacker right now. So it's like he's spending like I spend sometimes where I'll buy something and then it's like, oh, I bought those two mirrors. I literally have two mirrors because we're moving, so I'm getting ready to pack up stuff. I bought two mirrors from a furniture shop like a year ago. We just never hung them on the wall. Yeah. And that's a little bit like Sark in the portal. Not all of these guys are going to like absolutely be playing. We think about even the wide receiver position. There could be an odd man out or an odd two men out, depending on how the order of that plays out. He is really turning into a guy who's like, what's that? There's a leak in the dam? You know, let's put something in it. And he is not taking any chances. I think one of the real interesting thing about this and tie it into the recruiting, the good thing about these guys is like they are only here for a year. So Texas once had a pretty small senior class. Now they're up to 16. You know, that almost guarantees you that you're going to take another big class, Jason, in 2025 because they're at 16 seniors before they have a single departure next year from the portal or anything that happens. And so you can just close your eyes and easily see them taking 25, 30 guys next year because there will be a cleansing of the scholarship board, I think, every year. Yeah, you know, I get that question. I'm doing, in fact, I'm doing a Q&A for tomorrow, and I know I get it every single week. How many guys are we going to take this year? And I'm like, first off, my answer is always going to be the same. It's probably going to be a pretty close to a full class. Secondly, yeah. <laughs> secondly <laughs> it's still unpred- I don't think Sark even knows that answer because the portal, man, just really just jumbles those numbers up, and they can fluctuate so wildly. So – my standard go-to answer is like, eh, it'll be about 25, you know, give or take. So it might be 23, it might be 26, 27. But um, yeah, I mean, you're right. They're up to 16 seniors. You factor in attrition, uh, you know, whatever else happens. I mean, it'll it'll probably be a, a full class. One. Texas has had more than 10 players worth of attrition in every season but one since 2008, I think. That's, so that's that's a lot of history to look at and be able to say you can almost bank on 10 guys departing for whatever variety. It used to be like, yeah, you can count on five guys getting arrested and two guys getting hurt. And, but, you know, you, you can always like ballpark. The portal has really made it so that 10 is a pretty easy answer to get to. So suddenly they're sitting on 16 seniors. Here's your Longhorn senior class. What's interesting about this is how many of these guys have come in through the portal. You've got Silas Bolden, Gunnar Helm, Juan Davis, Hayden Connor, Jake Majors, Baron Sorrell, Vernon Broughton, Alfred Collins, Tia Savea, Bill Norton. Now you've got Blackwell, Benda, Blackshire, Holmes, and Makuba. So six out of your 16 are transfers that weren't originally in the class. And that number might grow again. You know, I, they're, I think they're going to at some point bring in a punter. It's funny. I was Chad, I was talking about a Notre Dame punter going in to the weekend for the war room. 
and I mentioned Notre Dame's starting punter entered the portal, and I kind of crouched it as one of the bad things is he's got three years of eligibility remaining because that all, that's a lot, whereas mm-hmm. a lot of these guys are just one-year rentals, and if they work great and if they don't, you flush that scholarship and have another one available the next year. Which- especially with Texas having an incoming freshman scholarship punter. What are you going to take a guy with three years eligible? eligibility? Exactly. Right? And he's going to sit there for three years. So yeah. You take a guy with one year of eligibility, like you did a year ago. And, and you find out if your freshman is going to be really good or not. And then if so, he's like a four year starter next year. Um, it is important to note that Texas has three players on special teams scholarship. So they got one deep snapper in Lance St. Louis, which is funny. There was a lot of uproar when they took Lance St. Louis as a prospect, but he's a starter at deep snapper. He's going to be for the next two seasons. That will be a really well done Jeff Banks uh, recruitment when it was all said and done. You've got Will Stone at kicker, who's not the kicker. And then you got Michael Kern coming in as a true freshman, as Jason mentioned. He's one of five freshmen that weren't early enrollees. There weren't many. He's one of the five. But, you know, they can't count on that guy going into the season to be the punter. They've never even had him in a practice yet. I would, it, not to go down the Michael Kern rabbit hole, but he was at the All-American Bowl down in San Antonio. And I was like, all right, I I'm actually want to see this kid kick. He got one kick and it was blocked. So we <laughs> I wanted to see how he, let's see how he handles a national television audience. And, you know, it might be a little mini view of how he might have to handle the pressure at Texas and uh, didn't get to see anything else. As we're uh, cleaning off some chats here, guys, looks like our investigative reporter, Money B, might have some info for us. Money B, good to see you at the event on Friday night. Money B says the wedding needed to be done before his wife graduated there was limited venue availability so the dates were minimal Bullshit. Money, B, money b with some broughton inside information or whatever again everybody's situation is different we don't know the particulars uh, of what went on but there's money b's angle on i'm it. letting you hey, i'm just letting you know if my replacement is on the sideline i i gotta be i gotta protect my turf yeah, I would think I, I would think so as well. Also, Mike throws in R.I.P. to the red cat. Uh, cat. Thank God. Yeah. Thank and, and fellas, when I was watching the spring game, I guess it was the second half at some point, a third or fourth quarter run for Savion Red when he jumped up and started screaming and hollering and he was all pumped up. I asked myself, is he doing that for the fans in attendance or is he doing that for teams around the country? Like, how did that, you know, where, where was that? It, was, it felt like there was a lot of emotion coming out there, uh, but it almost felt like a guy that knew it was almost a job interview with somebody else, Jason. At least that's the way it felt to me. Yeah, you know, I think the writing was on the wall there when we showed up to the first practice. Savion was a little bit out of shape and start. He didn't get on him too much, but he said, hey, he needs to lose some weight, and these two true freshmen come in, and they look really good. And, you know, you're starting to wonder, okay, what's Savion's role going to be? And, Remember, he was a guy that was committed to SMU, flipped to Texas late. Uh, Texas went after it late. So, you know, maybe he goes back to the DFW area. You know, I'm not sure. Um, but it, it just makes a lot of sense. And so, real quick, back to the Vernon Broughton deal. Yeah. Um, he's got a younger brother who's a defensive lineman. I think he's a senior this year. Now, Texas Tech offered him after he, he did really well at the Under Armour camp. So, you know, I'm not I'm not sitting here writing Vernon Broughton off and saying, hey, he's going to leave or anything like that. But if he does, it's just something to consider. Those two, maybe they try to team up somewhere. And personally, like uh, Money B said, he knows the family. Vernon Broughton's mom is like the nicest lady in the world, dude. I've, I loved her when Vernon was a recruit. I actually saw her at their Under Armour camp and made it a point to seek her out. Uh, so Money B, if you know the family, tell them I said, what's up? Really, really good people. But he does have a younger brother who's a defensive lineman. So who knows? Maybe it's something to consider, you know, if, if this thing just gets too – Log jammed in Austin. Maybe he and his brother can team up somewhere. And uh, in in terms of obviously staying at the position here uh, with the D tackles, we're you know mentioning Bill Norton is officially in today. Transfers in the number sits at eighty four with Savion Red uh, going into the transfer portal, headed out uh, from Austin. Remind me, was Toya in for this weekend as well, or was he was? Yeah, he. In, in fact, Chad, they brought in. He's got a younger brother who's a freshman. 2027 player 
uh, and they brought both of them came in. They offered the younger brother. So, okay. um, you know, if we're going to transition there, like I saw them both there. I got pictures of them at, at the game. They were there. I talked to uh, Toia, 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 whatever. Uh, I talked to Jay like for literally like a minute on Sunday. He was going to the airport. He didn't really want to talk, but he said it was a really good visit. He entered the portal on Thursday. He's in Austin on Friday. He brings his brother, his the rest of his family. They offer the brother uh, the Johnny Nansen connection from their time together at UCLA. Every, you know, everything about that one makes perfect sense for Texas. I have not heard that he's taking any other visits. I've been trying to get in touch with him to, to find out some of those uh, specifics, but I haven't been able to, to to get that information yet. But just everything about this puzzle seems to fit with him committing to Texas. So I catch and I, I said it earlier to catch. I was like, it's kind of just to me, it feels like it's kind of just a waiting game for when it's going to happen more so than if it's going to happen. Yeah. And then in terms of numbers uh, catch, I was looking at it. Salvea was mentioned earlier and Jason made the, the, the comment about Salvea and the, the reps with Norton as he's going to see a familiar face walk back in. But 14 solos for Norton and 32 total tackles, I believe, is the number. It's 22 for Salvea. So he had 10 more total tackles, uh, only six solos for Savea in terms of the comparison. And Toia kind of fits in the middle there. Uh, I got him at 28 total tackles last year for UCLA, about 18 solos. He had a sack. He had a pass defense. So Toia's numbers kind of fit in between those two, uh, if people are wondering. Uh, but in terms of production catch, it's about the same as what Norton was able to give Arizona. Yeah, and look, I think – you know, one of the things Bill Norton does is it's not sexy, but he allows like the linebackers around him to get stats. And that's kind of who he is as a player. He's a space eater. He eats up blocks while holding up the point of attack. Uh, but he's not going to get, he's not, he's not a, like an athletic guy. I mean, this isn't a guy that, you know, we've been talking about Baron Sorrell and like he's leads the big 12 in pressures, but he's got to find a way to convert those. Like that's not Bill Norton's not having that conversation. It's not like, oh, I got to convert these pressures into sacks. It's not really who he is. And 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 you know, quite frankly, from a production standpoint, these guys are pretty good players. They're 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 barely plus players. Most of these guys are not good enough to go to the draft. This isn't Walter Nolan. This isn't like you know, play one year at Ole Miss, and then he's going to go off to the NFL. The, you know, Bill Norton, if he was really an NFL prospect, he'd already be off to the NFL. He wouldn't be coming back uh, for a super – and I know there is a Tavondre Sweat example, and to some degree even uh, Alfred Collins. But, you know, I, Bill Norton's not a big-time NFL prospect. Uh, Jay Toai isn't either. I mean, you know, I think there's a chance they'll play in the NFL – but they might be late draft picks. They might be undrafted. But these guys represent better immediate depth and quality than Texas has on hand right now. And I think, I think Texas fans got to kind of re, like they got to reimagine what this defense is and where the production comes from. A year ago, there wasn't a ton of production production from the edge, and you know here, God, there was a while when. Ethan Burke disappeared for like six weeks. And it was like, oh, well, they're just not getting much production from the edge spot. Uh, this year, I think they're going to get a lot of production. a lot, and, and, and consequently, the production from the defensive tackles, you're not getting what Sweat and, and Murphy contributed a year ago. So this defense is going to look different. The strength of it's going to be different. And I think what Sarkeesian's just trying to find is guys – that make sure that the interior is not a weakness. It's not going to be a heavy strength, but I think they're just trying to load up on bodies that will allow that to be solid. And I don't know that you would call it solid exiting the spring. Clearly Sark not happy with the total amount of talent, the volume of talent. So, you know, he's doing this because he thinks it's the area on the team that needs to be addressed in order for this team to be a national championship contender. And then I think there are just layers to, you know, what it is that we're talking about. These guys are not going to show up and be all SEC players, but they might be in the top half of the SEC at their positions. You know, Bill Norton might be one of the top seven or eight nose tackles in the SEC, Chad. But mm -hmm. 
And that doesn't sound overly impressive until you say, until today, Texas may not have had one of the top 15 nose tackles in the SEC. And then suddenly having a guy who maybe is in the top seven sounds a lot better than it did earlier in the day when maybe maybe you had the worst starting nose tackle in the SEC. Like I, I think it's probably like a legitimate conversation. Yeah, I would think I, I would I would hope for Texas to say it wasn't the worst of the sixteen, but I mean, Vernon Broughton last year was a sub, like substandard player. When you look at his efficiency as a as a player, production per snaps, all of those things, you put them into Alex Dunlap's little grading score, and it wasn't great. It was I think he was like the thirtieth ranked player on the Texas defense, something like that. Right. And you know, I mean. He's first in line because a bunch of guys have departed and because Bo Davis did a really job, poor job of, of bringing in talent that today is competing. Vernon Broughton's still a Tom Herman recruit. Like, right. they're still on the Tom Herman providing both him and Alfred Collins. Like, we've yet to see a defensive tackle recruited in the – Steve Sarkeesian window of uh, as him as a head coach that's contributing on this team. And the, this is, we, this is the stuff like out, Jason and I write and we report on this stuff and people are like, Hey, you guys are yelling fire in a crowded theater. And it's like, well, no, eventually the bill comes due for these things that don't happen. And I think when we talk about, look, Bo wasn't doing a great job or even a real good job as a recruiter. What we're seeing right now with this team scrambling to find players for this season that they feel comfortable with is a real indictment on what he did as a recruiter at Texas. That hmm. top two guys are still Herman guys. The guy, the top two guys below that are like transfers. And the guys that Bo Davis was responsible for stockpiling – um, aren't cracking the two deep right now. So you think Sark might tell you that whoever the D tackle is at Vanderbilt, uh, Mississippi State, whoever, w w all over the conference, there's 15 of them better than Broaden. I mean, I don't know that for certain, but I think he'd be in the, the conversation for among, I mean, we're not talking about a return. Not, not Most schools, you know, a lot of schools will be breaking in right. nose tackles. Yeah, um, but the thing is, last year Vernon was a Big Twelve player, and and competing against Big Twelve talent and the big and, and Texas's schedule, which was pretty good schedule, but nonetheless, you know Vernon from a production per snap basis was one of the worst graded defensive players on the team, so you know it's probably a conversation. And I think the thing about Bill Norton is it's not sexy, but like that guy's a proven starter on a power five defense that ranked in the top 25 nationally as a defense. And he played, you know, all of the big boys last year. He, he saw all of those ranked teams that were in the Pac-12 and he was a, a solid player. You want to go look at maybe his, one of his best games, go look at the Washington game, a team that beat Texas in the semifinals and played in the national championship game against that level of competition, he played really, really well. Now, Bill Norton's limitations are such that if you watch the Oklahoma game and don't watch the Washington game, you'll probably come away thinking, we don't have anybody better than that. So, you know, he has limitations. I think if you're going into this wondering if Bill Norton's going to have five sacks, 10 tackles for loss, and be an all SEC level player, I I don't think you have a handle on what Texas is getting in Bill Norton. He's a really solid, good, capable player, but he's not a playmaker. He's not going to post a bunch of stats. Uh, and it's about getting a little bit better than you were yesterday. And I think that's what Texas accomplished today in, in getting Bill Norton from Arizona. Uh, man, uh, Money B back in with a super chat this time. Thank you, Money B. $10 buy or sell. The 24 defense will be better than the 23 defense, Jason. Yeah, 
I read that when you posted it, and I've been thinking about it a little bit. Um, it's a tough one to answer because, like, I agree with Ketch. This defense is going to look so much different. I think you're going to get a lot more pop from your edge players, right? Uh, some new faces there that I think are going to help. I think the secondary is going to be much improved. But losing those two interior defensive linemen, uh, you know, your strength now becomes a weakness. Your weakness last year, your back end becomes a strength. Uh, Ant Hill having more experience is going to help. Um, man, it's tough money, B, but I'm going to sell that. I just think when you're losing two, you know, you have the defensive player of the year and the defensive lineman of the year. Uh, you take those guys out of the equation. I just think there's going to be a little bit of a step back there. I think the pass defense will be better, but overall, yeah, I'm probably going to sell, but that's a, that's a really close one. It's a really good question. I'm going to buy it. I'm buying. Ryan? Yeah. I okay. think, I mean, your biggest strength is your biggest weakness right now, but I think the edge play is significantly better. I think the secondary play will be significantly better. I think the edge play will help the secondary play. I think Anthony Hill is going to be an upgrade of Jalen Ford. My concern with Anthony Hill, though, if these defensive tackles and, and maybe – you know, the Arizona guys can, like you said, they're space eaters. They free up Anthony Hill. But if he doesn't have those two big defensive tackles right in front of him, you know, taking on blockers or making plays of their own, things are going to be able to scheme away from him a little bit more, or maybe get more bodies in front of him or on him. So I'm counting on Johnny Nansen yeah, putting Anthony Hill yeah. in advantageous. You know, I, I wonder if we get the anti – Harold Perkins move, Chad, where they had Harold Perkins at LSU right. just running around making plays, and that wasn't good enough. They wanted Harold Perkins to be a conventional every down linebacker, a little, a little more tamed. And I think they did that with Anthony Hill last year. He was unbridled, like an unbridled horse for the first few weeks of the season. And then as the rest of the season went on, like his overall game got better. He started, you know, you were, he was making like eight, nine tackles a game, but it wasn't like the big playmaking Anthony Hill. I think one of the things that Johnny Nansen will bring to this defense this year is the ability to turn Anthony Hill loose a little bit. Um, but Jason makes a good point. If the, if the, Interior play is worsened, and and they can't hold the point of attack if they're losing the game, the line of scrimmage. You know, the tra that that will impact Anthony Hill and his ability. It'll be interesting to see how good this run defense is, considering it was a top five run defense a year ago. I think the pass defense has nowhere to go but up. I I understand why Jason sold. And I think if we sat here and wrote it down on paper and said, well, the run defense was top five last year, and this year we think it's going to be top 30? Like, I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that question really is right now. But it feels like the secondary play will be much better. And I think you know, if they're ranked in the 50s this year, that's like a monumental improvement from the hundreds. So it may be that the meeting – is somewhere in the middle. So maybe both Jason and I can both be kind of right and kind of wrong. I don't know. It'll be curious to see. I think this group is going to make more big plays though, that more playmakers at edge and better physical players in the secondary, I think will make for a better, a, a, a better defense when it's all said and done. But, you know, I will say this, man, it's hard not to look at that second corner and go, are they how much better are they going to be in the secondary if you get a little taste of what Terrence Brooks? I hate to call the guy out because he really hasn't been bad this spring, kind of the opposite. But some of those plays in the spring game were so bad, you know, point shaving would almost make more sense than he just didn't know what he was doing because some of that stuff was pretty ABCs of playing the secondary, knowing what coverage you're in knowing what support you, you have, and then not knowing that in the middle of the play when you're on the first-team defense going against first-team 
competition on offense just was bewildering. Um, I have some doubts about how, you know, I wonder if Jade Barron, when it's all said and done, this isn't even a recruiting discussion anymore, but there's a part of me that wonders, is Terrence Brooks definitely in their top five? If, if we're just talking about who the better player is, Jalen Gilbo versus Terrence Brooks, I wonder how the coaches would answer that. If there was a, a draft today for this season and you're just taking the best players, because if Gilbo is the answer, then I wonder if that means Barron might move outside when he's fully healthy and he comes back in the fall. And do they lean on Gilbo, who played extensively with the first team defense throughout camp? I'm interested to see what happens there because it was one of the glaring negatives about Saturday, even more so than the defensive tackles. You couldn't really tell with the blind eye that there were any real concerns about the D tackles in the spring game. They didn't run the ball offensively. Kai Woods put himself in the portal today. He led the team in rushing with like 24 yards on Saturday. <laughs> Savion Red was second with 18 yards. He's in the portal. Uh, so it wasn't like they got gashed with the run game. There's just a lot of interesting questions that I don't have answers to right now. Money B, thank you for that super chat. We appreciate it. Thanks to over 900 folks in that Specs chat. Speaking of, we'll take a breath, let Specs talk to you, and then we're talking more recruiting hour stuff. Stay with us. You're needing Specs same day delivery can save the day with our Specs app or online shopping. From world class wines to hard to find spirits and craft beers to gourmet foods, delicious snacks, and spectacular sweets. It's Specs. Cheers to savings. And another reminder, the uh, promo code for you is OB Spring 24, the very latest uh, in the portal. There's eight days left for that in that portal window here in the spring. And then obviously headed towards a big time season with the Longhorns, or about 130 days from kick by one month. Get three months free with orangebloods.com. There's your QR code to scan. We appreciate those of you that have already scanned that code during the show. All right, fellas, uh, anything else we need to hit portal-wise or we want to get to a little bit of a, a – talk about some recruits at the spring game? One last thing before we just turn the show over to Jason. Okay. My guy, Dan Wetzel, just tweeted out the, his podcast with Pat Forty and Ross Dellinger. They, the three of them do a podcast together. Mm -hmm. First 15 minutes of the podcast, Chad, Arch Manning. <laughs> there it is. Then the Michigan and Notre Dame spring games. Then some Nick Saban. Then some other portal talk. Like, hey, don't y'all ever say Sark don't feed the machine. Sark <laughs> feeds the machine, man. He is feeding everybody's machine today. The first up, they don't talk about anything other than what they're calling arch madness. <laughs> I can't say that I haven't used that as well. I was going to say, right? <laughs> Until the 1543 mark, it's all Arch. That's it. Yeah. Somebody on their podcast said that there's on Orange Bloods this morning, like they were discussing that Arch should hit the portal. I'm like, I'm not even going to click that. I'm not even going to give that the. Uh, the time to listen to his reasoning for that. So. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it's a, it's guys. We, we I make the circus analogy a lot. And you just think about if you live at the circus, you're on the grounds, you're on, un, you're under the big top, you're just outside the big top, you're feeding the animals, you're dealing with every the, the day in and day out stuff. You have no idea what it looks like from half a mile away, but from half a mile away, people might tell you that's the craziest looking circus I've ever seen in my life. That's why we always go. You don't understand that. Y'all got fireworks shooting out of that place like all day long. It's the place to be. That's what they're seeing from a distance after. After that game Saturday, I mean, it's just going to be na – it's natural. The headlines are going to be there, and the circus just keeps rolling. It's, it's just the way it is. Um, All right, Jason, tell us about recruits. Uh, Yeah, well, Money B, do you want to put up – he put up a, another super chat, Money B. I'll, I, I was going to say, this might feed right into it. $5 super chat from Money B. Besides Moore and Fasusi, who's the most important recruit on the board? Yeah, and unfortunately for Texas, neither one of those guys was in Austin last week. Uh, 
uh, DeCorey Moore was running track and Fasusi was in College Station. So uh, A&M's had him on campus like three times in the last, whatever, three weeks. I've always thought that was a Texas in Oklahoma battle. Maybe time to put A&M in that group as well. Um, man, those two are so head and shoulders above everybody else. Money be in my opinion. Like I'm going down Texas's offer list. I mean, KJ Lacey's already committed. You know, I, I would put another receiver in there, a guy like Jamie French, the uh, Rivals 100 receiver out of Florida. You know, Texas wants to continue to stockpile offensive playmakers. Uh, you know, Riley Pettijon would be a big one I would probably put in there. Um, they got Bo Barnes committed. You know, Jonah Williams would be one, but I don't know that Texas is in a great spot there, if I'm being completely honest. But, uh, you know, those would be a few names. But I think the two you mentioned to me, uh, Money B, DeCorey Moore and Mike Fasusi are head and shoulders probably above uh, just about everybody else. Maybe DJ Sanders. You know, we talked about defensive tackles. So maybe put DJ Sanders in there as well. So, um, so talking about guys from this weekend, you know, I'm not going to sit here and blow smoke and tell everybody it was the most jam packed uh, recruiting list we've ever seen, right, Catch? But there were some big names. I think there were a lot of guys in that will probably wind up being in this recruiting class. And you got to remember, Texas had a big recruiting weekend, The la- uh, obviously, for the, the spring game. The week prior to that, they had a bunch of guys in. The week prior to that, they had a ton of guys in. So, you know, they kind of got a lot of their heavy lifting done in early April, mid-April, but then they had some guys come in last week. I'm, I'm looking at my notebook, and a shameless plug, yes, yeah, scan that QR code, sign up to Orange Blitz, because we've got a lot of recruiting notes, and I've got a lot more interviews I need to transcribe still. But uh, James Simon, Chad, I wrote about him today as a running back out of Shreveport, Louisiana. You and I talked, I think it was on the recruiting show last week. You said, hey, if there was anybody that maybe would commit, and I, I – I said, you know what, I'll throw James Simon in there as a wild card. Uh, And, you know, he came out of that visit. I talked to him before he left, and he was like, oh, man, an amazing visit. He loved his time with Coach Choice, Coach Sark. And then he said, hey, I'm going to go home. And first he said maybe as early as starting on Monday because, you know, he goes, I'll probably wait until like the first week of May because I'm going to sit down and try to come to a decision. You know, I I might go ahead and do that. And if I I feel ready, I'm just going to commit. If not, then I'll take my official visits, but I'd like to get it done before that. Um, interestingly, he has one official, vi- listen, let's do the math. He wants to commit in May. Possibly he has one official visit set up. It's Texas in June, mm-hmm. June 21st. He set that up this weekend. So I said, James, I feel like you're kind of tipping your hand a little bit here, dude. And he kind of laughed. He's like, yeah, we'll see. And I said, so what if you commit somewhere other than Texas? I said, do you cancel that Texas visit? He goes, yeah, that's what I'd have to do. But I think Texas has made a really strong impression there. You know, he mentioned, uh, A&M, Alabama, Notre Dame, and LSU. LSU's got a couple running backs committed there, so I don't know that they'll be a huge factor. So James Simon, I think Texas did a great job there. K.J. Lacey, the Texas quarterback commitment was in. You know, K.J., like, I've interviewed him so much, including very recently. I didn't really need to interview him, didn't have a lot to ask him about, but he did tell me, of course, he's got his Texas official visit, and he said that's the only one. He's not planning any other visits he seems just completely locked in. Um, Amari Winston, uh, Texas commitment was there. The tight end was there for like a three-day visit. I'll tell you another guy that I had on commitment watch, and I actually uh, be, kind of peeked behind the curtain. I texted this dude Saturday morning. I'm like, hey, man, I'm not going to report it, but are you thinking you might commit? Because I just want to be ready if you are. And that's Kel- Kelshawn Johnson, the wide receiver out of Hitchcock. And I'm telling you guys, he had a really good visit, but – and coach, uh, the Texas coaches, Chris Jackson, said, hey, dude, when you're ready, we're ready. Come on, let's do it today. Whenever you're ready, go ahead and commit. We will take it whenever you're ready. And I think Kelshawn, he didn't come out and specifically say it, but I think he kind of felt it a little bit. But then he's like, you know what, Coach, I want to go ahead and take my official visit. So uh, he's got OVs to Texas, USC, TCU, Texas Tech, working on setting one up with a and I think that's Texas and USC. I felt that way for a while. I think Texas is, is head and shoulders above everybody else. Uh, there were a lot of underclassmen in, Chad, but I'm going to give you one other uh, 2025 guy that was a bit of a surprise visitor. I, nobody had him on their list. Uh, he kind of showed up under the radar. We saw him walking out, and we're like, whoa. Uh, actually, it was another reporter I was talking to. He's like, hey, that's Caleb Edwards. He's a tight end out of California. I'm like, damn, good eye, man. So uh, Caleb Edwards is a, a tight end. Doesn't do a lot of interviews and stuff, so he's kind of under the radar. But he's uh, he came in for the spring game. Talked to him as he was leaving, had a really good visit. He'll be back 
for an official visit. He's also going to take official visits to UCLA and then Washington, Oregon, and Alabama. Uh, and he's been this spring. He went to Texas and Auburn and Georgia and Alabama. So he's, he's a three-star guy out of El Dorado Hills, California, but his offer list does not scream three-star guy. Texas really likes him. They brought him in this weekend. He's coming back for an official visit. A little too open, he said. He goes, man, I don't really have any favorites. I, I feel like I need to see a few more places. But the fact that he came in on his own dime, is coming back for an official visit, uh, tells me he's a pretty serious player in terms of his interest in Texas. So there weren't a ton of 2025 guys, but those ones that I just mentioned, I think Texas has a really good chance with every one of them. Hmm. Catch, you got something for Jason? Well, there's a good – if you don't mind, I'll just jump in, uh, Derek, with another good chat uh, question. Oh. Kelly Russell is the only quarterback that signs – in the 2025 class. Now I'm glad he brought him up. Keelan came in. He's the Duncanville quarterback. He came in on Sunday. He had uh, competed in the regional track meet on Saturday with the Corey Moore and those other guys qualified for state, by the way. So I'll be out there to see them in a couple of weeks. Um, but the only quarterback that signs in the 2025 class by herself, Derek, that's a really, really good question, dude. There's a part of me that wants to buy it because he's the in-state guy. He's from Duncanville. You kind of increase that pipeline. Uh, you know, it maybe helps you with the Corey and more. Plus, he's a really, really good player. He's committed to SMU right now, but he's got a lot of other schools coming at him. He's going to Ole Miss uh, this coming weekend. He's got some other official visits. Texas did not offer him. Um, I'm going to sell just because K.J. Lacey has been committed since last summer. So he's been committed a long time. And, yes, K.J. has taken some other visits but he's kind of starting to put that stuff out and kind of put those fires out. He's really starting to focus more in on Texas and Texas only. So I don't know how you really cut ties with KJ Lacey. I don't think Texas wants to cut ties with KJ Lacey. I know, I know they like him a lot. I think in a perfect world, they'd probably love to take both guys, but I just don't see a scenario that happened with that happening. Um, I could see a scenario where it ends up being Keelan Russell, but right now I'm still leaning with the bird in hand is K.J. Lacey being the guy that signs with Texas. There you go. Keelan and I'll, I'll say this. I'm sorry, Chad. I keep interrupting. In talking to Keelan, go to Orange Bloods, guys. I got a story on the front page. That, uh, that dude doesn't make any bones about it. He's committed to SMU, but he would love to be a Texas Longhorn. So if Texas offers him, you know, that, that'll get really, really interesting really, really quickly. First of all, Chad, I told you we were going to turn the entire show over to Jason. So, like, <laughs> We did. Uh, I just wanted to say I kind of like Russell in the sense that I think, first of all, like you can understand where Texas thinks they might need two quarterbacks in this class because as good as Trey Owens was in the spring game, you know, by the time we get another 12, this time 12 months from now, Trey Owens would be second string quarterback at Texas, but stuck behind Arch. There will be teams who were telling him, do you really want to wait till 2027 before you get a chance to start at quarterback? So in a world where if, and I don't think it'll happen because, you know, Trey Owens knew when he came to Texas that Arch was there and kind of knew the score, but you never know. And if anything were to happen, suddenly you'd be down to two true freshman running backs for or quarterbacks for depth. I think, or one, right, in a world where they only take one quarterback in this class, they would have three on scholarship next year. And if Owens were to leave at all, it just leaves you really short in numbers. And it's a tricky place to try to go into the portal to tell guys, hey, come portal in, but you're either A, only going to be the backup quarterback, or B, you've got to wait until – probably Arch is done before you – it's, you know, I don't know. So I kind of like Russell uh, almost because I can see him waiting till 2027 more so than I can K.J. Lacey, who waiting until year three is a long time for a guy who thinks he's one of the best quarterback prospects in the country. And then I was just going to say, Money B, I will list two other guys that Jason didn't for your $5 Super Chat. I think Kalik Lockett like goes up there with Jamie French as far as I'm concerned. So you could, if someone said, I think Kalik Lockett is the third best prospect that Texas is recruiting behind Moore um, 
And Fasusi, like I wouldn't argue too much. I love that guy. Um, and Keoti Armstrong, I'm just going to mention because I think he's the best tight end prospect since Martellus Bennett in 2005 from the state of Texas. Those guys are so hard to find. And he's just got everything that you're looking for. Everything screams future NFL player with that young man, barring all of the things that can happen to a guy that would cause a guy not to make it to the NFL, but I don't think talent would be it. So I'll mention those two guys just to give you a little bit more bang for your buck. All right, fellas, we've hit the hour mark. Jason, for you, any other recruiting notes uh, that we need coming out of the weekend? Uh, no, I just, I've got a notebook um, with some young, you know, guy like John Turntine, who's an elite, elite uh, 2026 offensive lineman was there. Uh, another guy, Pule Primus, is an offensive lineman at Midland. They haven't offered him, but he's a really good player. So K.J. Edwards is a running back in that 2026 class. Listen, if Texas wants to push for K.J. Edwards' commitment today, they'd probably have him by the end of the day. So that dude loves Texas a lot. So um, there were some underclassmen there, but I think we covered most of the, the big news, Chad. I'll have more kind of in-depth interviews with these guys throughout the week. And then, of course, even in the war room on – on uh, Thursday, and then this weekend there's a rivals camp. I'll be up in Dallas for that. The following weekend is uh, state track meet. So, dude, you and I say it, Chad, every week, recruiting never stops. But it better take a breather because after that state track meet week, I'm getting the hell out of Dodge for a few days. So. There you go. There it is. Catch, I'll throw that offer up one more time uh, before we do that. Anything else you got? No, throw it up there because literally we're all, we're like doctor baby doctors. We're like Cliff Huxtable without – the Bill Cosby part. Um, <laughs> yeah. We're on call. Like I, 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 our anticipation is that a more names could enter the portal. Uh, we're, we wouldn't be shocked if, you know, if the kid from if Jay Toa Toa, I'll have to learn how to say that name once he eventually to- commits. Toa. If he that guy could make a decision at any moment. Uh, I'm literally leaving here and I'm going to go to the gym and I'll be on the treadmill. So I'll have my phone handy catch because that's just how we do it. Right. So if it pops up on the treadmill, boom, submit story. That's, that's our line. Yeah. It's a good time to get one, four months for the price of one. Um, Cause there's a lot going on. There's a lot of content. And if, if you've never been on the message board, trust me. Um, it's an experience that's different than anybody else. You can sign up for all of the websites Everybody does good work. I would contend that if you've never been on the Orange Bloods message board, uh, everybody else in their dreams wishes that their message board was as good as ours. So check that out. One month, you get four. And if by that point, we haven't won you over and earned you know your long-term commitment, then maybe we're not as good as we think we are. We we're, we're pretty confident. It's why we want to give you four months for the price of one. Go check it out. Chad, wrap us up. All right. I'll just leave that code up there all the way till the end. And I also love this chat to finish off. National media talking about the program is what we want. Sark knows what he's doing. K-Drag, there you have it. There it is. Sark doesn't feel like he's afraid of much right now. Uh, Texas closing in on that first season in the SEC. Remember to like, subscribe, and get your notifications to Orange Bloods Live. The next recruiting hour will come your way Wednesday at 4. Who knows what's happened uh, at that point in terms of transfer portal. And who knows, maybe another commit adds to the 2025 list. You know you'll get the very latest at orangebloods.com and right here at Orange Bloods Live. Until Wednesday at 4, we are the recruiting hour.